Okay, hi there, Dr. Matthew J. Trom here. Um, this is going to be uh, a series of lectures on a slide deck uh, in the handling, insertion, and assembly time module of the course. Uh, and I'm specifically going to talk about the booth writing Dewhurst estimation technique uh, to determine assembly time. Um, there's about 34 slides total in this deck, uh, and it's going to take me uh, over 15 minutes, obviously, to talk about that many slides. Um, and so what I normally do when I have a, a long lecture to give uh, online um, is I break it up into into 15 minute segments. Uh, so I'll speak for about 15 minutes, give you guys a break, uh, and then start again uh, with a with a second part. Uh, go for 15 minutes, give you guys a break, and we'll just continue doing that uh, until I, I make it through the entire slide deck. Uh, so this is the first in a multi part series of. Um, online lectures uh, about about this particular subject, Booth Wright and Dewhurst estimation technique within the handling, insertion, and assembly time module of the course. Okay, so um, here's the outline that I intend to follow. Uh, we're gonna talk about what, what is assembly time. Uh, I'm gonna introduce to you the Booth Wright and Dewhurst assembly time technique, um, which is a, an estimate for how long it takes to put a series of parts together into assemblies um, and ultimately products uh, based on uh, a series of charts. Um, so we're going to talk about those charts and then I'm going to give you um, some reminders about sort of how those charts are set up based on design for manual assembly. Um, since we're talking about design for manual assembly anyway, uh, I'm going to give you some tips on how to design parts for your projects um, that are more easy to handle and therefore faster to assemble into sub assemblies and assemblies and ultimately therefore make the products cheaper to manufacture. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about um, the booth right in Dewhurst chart uh, navigation. So we're going to talk about grasping time, uh, symmetry angles, and then ultimately I'm going to give you guys an example of how to use the chart um, to, to determine uh, the time that it takes to, to grasp something. So we'll walk through all of that uh, in the context of, of this uh, presentation. Okay, so the first uh, question to ask is what is assembly time? Uh, well, it turns out that uh, the final assembly of many products uh, is actually done by people by hand. It's not, not mechanized, but it's done by hand. Um, and so what we're literally talking about is, um, you know, basically unskilled laborers um, who are given a, a whole series of parts that combine together into sub-assemblies and assemblies and ultimately products. And their job is to put all the pieces together to build the products uh, by hand through uh, this, these assembly techniques. Um, and it turns out that, that labor constitutes the bulk of production costs uh, done this particular way, um, and that explains uh, the migration of manufacturing uh, off U.S. soil to other places uh, where it, you still have, uh, you know, human laborers who are doing the assembly, but they... Um, are less expensive to, to hire uh, and less expensive to keep on staff because they're not in the U.S. and subject to uh, various U.S. laws. Um, and so ultimately, a lot of this manual assembly is done um, offshore uh, to keep the cost down. Um, so um, it's advantageous, as we'll find, um, to design parts whenever possible um, to make them easy to assemble and then to develop sequences of uh assembly sequences um, that are as fast as possible because ultimately that keeps the cost of manual assembly down and ultimately makes the products cheaper, uh, which is good because you could pass cost savings on to your customers or um, if you have a product that's you know less expensive than all the other ones to manufacture, um, it's more profit for your company, right? So we want to make sure these, these things are as inexpensive as possible um, when we put them out on the market. Um, Ultimately, the booth rate and Dewhurst technique uh, is based on um, tabulated times for a variety of operations that have been built up over years and years and years of study. Um, and so everything is tabulated into charts, and you'll ultimately use the charts to figure out how long it takes to do every single step uh, of an assembly process. But we'll, we'll get into that later. Um, okay, so... The next topic then uh, is looking at um, assembly time using the booth rate and Dewhurst techniques, and we'll start uh, by talking about the, the charts. Um, 
So in the Boothroyd and Dewhurst assembly time technique, um, every part must be handled and every part must also be inserted into a subassembly in progress. Um, and so there's there's two different processes. There's handling and there's insertion. Um, and so each of those processes has its own chart. Handling charts give the time that's required for the assembler to actually reach out and grab the part. And the insertion chart gives the time that's required for the assembler, if they've got the subassembly in one hand or sitting on the bench in front of them, to insert the part that they've just picked up and you know insert it, place it into the subassembly as they're building up the subassembly, um, ultimately into an assembly and then into a, a final product. So you're going to end up with the Boothroyd and Dewhurst technique seeing two different charts. One is the manual handling chart. The other one is the manual insertion chart. I realize that these are very small, difficult to read in this in this format. Um, I have uploaded them onto uh, the course uh, website so that you can get um, you know full scale charts so that you can see what they look like. Uh, but I wanted to just give you kind of a sense here um, of how they're laid out uh, before we get into the details of, of how to use them. So. Um, in summary, to do Boothroyd and Dewhurst, uh, this assembly time technique, you need two charts, manual handling chart and manual insertion chart. One first one is for picking up parts. The second one is for once you've picked up that part, inserting it into a subassembly. Okay, moving on then. Um, so kind of a couple of rules of thumb here. Um, the first one um, is to always apply the values from the Boothroyd and Dewhurst charts um, using their original intent. Um, so in other words, as you're looking at the charts, um, you might look at the amount of time that's allocated uh, for a particular process and say to yourself, well, God, that's ridiculous, right? How, how could it possibly take nine seconds to flip apart from top to bottom, right? I'm just flipping a part over. I can do that instantaneously. Why in the heck is, you know, Boothroyd and Dewhurst telling me that I need nine seconds for that process? Well, um, it, even though you might feel compelled um, to, to reduce the times because they seem ridiculously long, please do not do that. That's, that's not how these charts are set up. Uh, please just apply the values in the charts as you look them up based on the original intent. Um, now, the reason that some of those times are so long and seem so long um, is because these charts effectively represent a baseline, right? So we talked about um, assemblies usually done by, um, you know, low skilled laborers um, and the chart represents the amount of time it takes for them to do a repetitive sequence over and over and over again, eight hours a day, right? So um, we might have already done this in class or we will do it in the near future, uh, but we do an exercise where I have you guys take um, all of the, the pieces of um, some simple product and try to assemble them all together, right? And invariably, if you do it one time, you always get a time that's faster than the time that's estimated in the Boothroyd and Dewhurst assembly time charts. Um, why is that? Well, it's because you're only doing it once right and usually you guys are, are quite familiar um, with the parts and know how to sort of assemble them in the, in the, the best possible order in the best possible way um, and you have to remember that these charts are set up by basically watching and monitoring laborers assembling all kinds of different things over you know a very long period of time that this data was was, was gathered um, and so the numbers that you get represent somebody basically doing this for eight hours a day. They're not trying to speed through it. They're just trying to maintain, uh, you know, a reasonable pace to be able to, to keep up uh, for, for eight hours a day. Um, so, you know, it takes a lot of stamina to do this work. Um, and so they're not trying to rush through it. They're trying to do it at a pace that, that they can sustain for a long period of time. Um, so, so that's sort of the reason why um, a lot of the processes seem awfully long. Uh, if you think about just doing it once, uh, whereas if you you had to do it repetitively over and over and over again, uh, it might get, you know, relatively slower and slower over time. So, so please um, just, just use the numbers in the charts and don't, don't try to interpret them or reduce them or change them uh, because they are based on many, many, many years of, of empirical data um, collected from watching people um, assemble a variety of different products. Um, 
the final thing to keep in mind um, is that processes that, that we take for granted, because we usually as engineers don't do things in a repetitive way over and over and over again, uh, you know, it, it, unless you're solving homework problems, which sometimes can be a little repetitive. Um, the things that, that we do all the time, um, you might take for granted, but all of those processes take time, right? So reaching out to grab a part from a bin takes a few seconds, grabbing a tool off a workbench so that you can use it in some sort of assembly process takes time. If you've got an assembly that you need to, to flip over or twist or reorient, all those things take time. And we don't think about it as, as engineers that, you know, one or two seconds to grab a part or to grab a tool or to flip a subassembly over. Um, if you multiply that by hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of um, subassemblies that these folks are working on uh, for eight hours a day, those seconds add up to minutes and add up eventually to hours. Um, so it's really important not to skip any of those steps, um, even though they, they seem really fast and trivial to us, right? It's, oh, I'm going to flip over a part and that's really easy. Yes, but that does take a fixed amount of time. Uh, and so it's important that you keep track of that time in your assembly time calculation. Okay. Um, so just a, a couple of reminders um, about how these charts work. Um, so the charts are really based on design for manual assembly, DFMA, um, which is going to become very important to you guys in uh, EML 4501, which is the next course in the capstone design sequence, uh, because ultimately you guys will have the parts probably produced for you, uh, but it will be your responsibility to put the parts together into sub-assemblies and assemblies and ultimately prototype products. And we may have you make more than one, uh, in which case you're going to want to make it easy for yourself um, to, to put these parts together. Uh, in addition, there's always a possibility that something that comes out of 4501, 4502 might ultimately become a commercial product. Um, and so it is important, even at this early sort of prototype stage, to think about design for manual assembly, because ultimately if something becomes a product, we want to make it fast to assemble so that we can keep its cost down. Um, so, so DFMA, Design for Manual Assembly, um, rewards parts and processes that take less time. Um, so you're rewarded um, if you have parts that are symmetrical um, or are very easy to pick up. Uh, because then it doesn't matter what orientation you encounter them in, you can just pick them up very easily and stick them into your subassembly. Um, it also rewards snap fits um, and easy and quick and secure insertion. So if you've got a, a subassembly and you're able to just put a part into the subassembly and you don't have to hold it down, you don't have to screw it in, you don't have to sort of deal with it falling out, um, that is rewarded by, by the DFMA process. Um, Top-down assembly is also rewarded. So if you've got something just sitting on your desk and you can just sort of pile pieces on top of it to build like a, a pyramid or something like that, that is rewarded. Um, and having all insertions in the same direction is also rewarded um, so that you're not having to constantly reorient your subassembly as you're sticking parts into it. Um, things that you're penalized for uh, by DFMA um, are parts that are really, really big because they're sort of unwieldy to deal with or parts that are very, very small uh, because they're, they're hard to grab, right? Sometimes you have to use a tool, tweezers or something like that to grab something that's small. Um, you're penalized for parts that are uh, asymmetric. So you encounter them in some weird orientation and you have to orient them properly to get them into your subassembly um, or parts that are difficult to handle. So they're, they're sharp, um, they're hot for some reason, um, they're uh, somehow chemically active. You have to use, use gloves to, to touch them. Um, all those things are penalized. Um, you're also penalized for blind or difficult insertions. Um, you're penalized for if you have to like put force onto a part to insert it, that's resistance. Uh, and you're penalized for needing to use a tool, pliers, something like that to, to put a part into your subassembly. Uh, and finally, you're also penalized for, uh, for regrips and reorientation. So if you could just pick something up and put it into your subassembly without reorienting it, that's good. If you have to kind of pick it up with one hand and reorient it with the other hand and then insert it, that takes time and that's bad and you're penalized for that. Okay. Um, so I'm 
right up uh, onto my my initial 15 minutes here. Um, so so let's pause here, go take a break, um, take a rest for a little bit, and we'll reconvene uh, in the next video in the sequence, and we'll continue to talk about design for manual assembly.